Hi, I'm Brad, and this is a new series of video things with a focus on AR, which is something that we don't really focus on in the channel too much because, you know, we're all about escaping realism and AR is about improving realism. Probably a lost cause. But anyway, uh, a recent event happened called AWE. It's usually like the industry's one, one of the main events where the AR industry comes together, a lot of startups and stuff come to show off what they're working on. I did not go, but thankfully I had one of the best people I probably could go in there to spy for me. And uh, yeah, his name is Carl Gutag. If you've never known him, uh, I'm sure some of you who follow me and watch this channel do know him. He's a legend, and really just the industry in general. Uh, he's been covering this stuff for a while, and let me... Let me just stop talking about him. Maybe I'll just let Carl introduce himself right here. Hi, Carl. Hi there. <laughs> um, okay, well, if you want to, I can give you just a, a, on the screen here, hopefully, is a, just a quick background on me. I've been in the electronics industry for 44 years. I'm not an optics guy. Everyone thinks of me as an optics person. But actually, my background is in electrical engineering. I've got a master's in electrical engineering working on uh, basically specializing in computer architecture. Um, I started my blog, which I'm ironically in some ways most famous for today. My blog started in 2011. I uh, started talking about displays in general. I was planning on covering more about video games and early video game history. At some point, I hope to get back around to that because uh, I was involved in some of the very earliest video games. Um, and uh, but for, since 2011, I, so I'm here to uh, coming up on 11 years where I've been uh, writing about uh, displays, and mostly that turned into AR. I basically, fortuitously, if not, uh, Google Glass came about. I had a background in LCOS. I identified what was going on with Google Glass. I identified there was a HiMax chip in it, caused their stock to go up 200 million dollars in a couple of days. It's all documented. <laughs> it really <laughs> happened. And uh, so that kind of led to that. And then a few years ago, I ran a, I did, really dug in. Somebody said, oh, they're putting billions of dollars into this AR stuff. And I'm like, who is putting a billions of dollars in AR? And I learned about this company called Magic Leap. And I did, I've been following them then since that was probably, what, around 2016, I think and uh, wrote a bunch of articles about what they were doing. I predicted pretty well what they're doing by searching their patents. I have 150 US patents. My father and two brothers were patent lawyers. So I had a background in patents. And so I searched around on them and wrote a whole series kind of debunking. And I said, I pr I'd like to believe I said pretty much what A, I was correct in predicting what it would do. I was also, I think, correct in predicting it wasn't gonna be very successful. I also, looking back on it, was very much appalled by what they, because I, I found presentations going back to 2013. That's all published on the blog, too. And where I found what they proposed to do. And ironically enough, basically everything they proposed to do, as of Magic Leap 2, they're not doing today. Right. <laughs> they, had, they had one kind of leftover feature from their original proposal. Uh, but pretty much it's a hollow lens where they moved it closer to the eye and all that. No, I, I think, um, I mean, that's that's definitely important. I'm glad you went over the Magic Leap one because that's that's kind of where I think you really gained traction. A lot of your followers that follow you from the AR stuff was your Magic Leap one. Um, but I think we'll we'll talk even more about Magic Leap one and maybe uh, when we start talking about Magic Leap two, which you finally actually got to see at AWE. Yeah, they were nice enough. I, I will say, you know, they know... I, my reputation precedes me. Generally, my my kind of booth strategy now is to stand in the booth and wait for somebody to notice me. And if the people in the boat, if I have to tell them about my blog, then they're not somebody I need to talk to. Right. Uh, I'll regularly be in a booth. I'll start talking to somebody, and then they don't know who I am from Adam's Ad, and then somebody will see me, and all of a sudden they realize, oh, he was somebody. Uh, so I usually get the under the, I get stuff that gets pulled out from under tables, and I get... When guys are out of brochures, they'll hand me brochures that they don't have and <laughs> stuff like that. I, I, I think that's really good because um, there's kind of a stigma. Um, I mean, I, I'm coming from the YouTuber side for VR. Yeah. There's this general fear um, because, you know, 
VR and AR are both very small market, like, industries still. So a lot of people, especially on the YouTube, they're always afraid to be too honest for a lot of these products because they, they're worried they're just not going to get the treatment that you're getting. Um, so it's very awesome of really Magic Leap to still give you the respect and everything and let you um, test out the, yeah, the bonus it's, stuff. It's, it's a little bit interesting. Uh, I had the same thing with, with I'm even more notorious. Actually, the one of the first companies that really got my blog going was Microvision with their laser beam scanning. And I'm just not at all, and to this day, I'm not at all impressed by laser beam scanning. And I'm, I'm known as being fairly anti it. But even so, they get they brought me up to the suite and all that stuff. I got uh, so they treated me fairly well. Um, so I, you know, it's not a personal animosity thing with me. I'm an engineer who's analyzing stuff, so I'm trying to make it work. This is the thing I've, I've explained many times on my blog: is I write from the as an engineer who designed things. I built a whole bunch of products that went to market, particularly in my days at TI. Not as successful in the startup world. I had a, basically I had. Uh, 20 years of Texas Instruments, uh, finishing off my resume a bit, but I was 20 years with Texas in Instruments. I was the youngest TI fellow in the history of the company. I designed almost everything from the late 70s to the late 90s. I was involved in, involved in computer graphics. I was on the processor side, though. I designed CPUs. I designed the very first chip to have sprites. I think that was used in 9918, ColecoVision. TI home computer, MSX computer in Japan. And as uh, I think you've noted before, it was it was almost directly cloned, or SuperSec clone, if you know, a Z80. Mm -hmm. They kind of did Z80 versions of it, both Sega and Nintendo was a little more uh, freehand. But the, okay. Nintendo uh, definitely, and there's, there's quotes from uh, people who developed the Nintendo that they were looking at ColecoVision, which used my chip, because ColecoVision, they had the Donkey Kong on it. It was considered the best port of any of them. Uh, so when you talk about so many sprites on a line, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, that was my idea. <laughs> I was trying to figure, we only had so much time, and I came up with the whole pre-process, we call pre-processing, and Nintendo has, I think, a slightly different name for it, but they're doing the same processing. So anyway, I did that. Then I got involved in doing, I did one of the very first graphics accelerators. Uh, there's a good story on that. I had a war with Intel. Um, uh, Intel um, and I both did graphics accelerators. This would have been in the early 80s. I did a full-up general-purpose CPU that would also do computer graphics. It was called the 340 family, and it was probably one of the first, it was the first successful flexible graphics processor. In that day and era, we were done in by Microsoft and the, their software that they would not pass to us the level of commands that we can handle. They would pass things only at a very low level. Company, you probably heard of ATI. There were other yeah. companies, but ATI was around. Now they're part of AMD. They were competitor to me. Nintendo, um, um, Nvidia came on even after I kind of got out of graphics. Uh, but I did one of the very first six, uh, moderately successful graphics processors, the 340 family, and that was very much my idea. Before that, I actually d did two 16-bit CPUs. I really think it's cool for my community because um, I, I know, again, uh, a lot of my community started, are, are big fans of VR, and VR market today is mostly just gamers. So bringing you on the show, I'm sure it's some of their parents played on the systems that your chip was in or, or, or your chip had something to do with or maybe your, your, your gra graphics accelerator. So um, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about for chips. <laughs> Yeah, out of, out of the, you know, it's all about bandwidth. One of the things you start to realize is that, it, particularly in graphics and stuff, although in the case of uh, graphics in my day was all about moving pixels around, bit align transfers and stuff. Right. Um, in the, um, um, it went on to being a lot more about floating point operations. Uh, that kind of happened. We had floating point associated, but we only forward like one floating point processor to co-processor with a, with a processor, um, but yeah, um, uh, we're, we're, I don't want to get too far off the beam, but we came very close with my 340 family to being the original graphics accelerator for the color Mac. There's a very sad story that goes with that, uh, but I, I think I'll, I'll save that for now. Uh, but one other thing that was I was involved in that everybody uses this day 
is the way that synchronous DRAMs work. They were really a variant of a thing called the synchronous video RAM, um, which then became the graphics RAM. So you know about the graphics RAMs today. Well, the whole a lot of the ways that worked in the early days of that. See, the the 918 that Sprite chip was the first consumer product to use d dynamic RAM, and I actually figured out the timing for the dynamic RAM interface on the 918. And it was a pain in the ass. It's about <laughs> 10 pages of specs that you have to meet. And a lot of people will just try to meet the top line spec. And you'll find down in those 10 pages, there's some spec you definitely violate. Because originally, DRAMs were designed to work, believe it or not, with analog delay lines, one nanosecond analog delay. The edge, you don't, you, don't, you don't appreciate today how complicated it was to drive a DRAM. And there was no way to drive those edges fast enough. So what we had to do with the 918, and one of the things that slowed us down, and one of the things that limited the number of sprites in a line, was how many um, memory cycles we could do. And we were limited because we had to round to a clock. They would put specs on a sheet. They would tell you what their maximum speed was. It was unattainable unless you had one nanosecond delay line. You had to have like almost arbitrarily large numbers, like about six or eight, one nanosecond place delay lines to put all the edges in the right place. And what we did with synchronous DRAM originally, I don't know what they do today, but we actually moved all that timing inside the DRAM so that now you just had a clock. I was a year and a half out of college. This shows you how crazy it was. <laughs> I was a year and a half out of college when I became lead CPU architect on the 9995. If the home computer program had not been canceled, the 9995 was going to be the next generation. It was designed in. There was a 99-5, a 99-8, and a 99-2. They were all going to use the 9995, and it would use my 9918, which is in the home computer. And the, so I'd had, I'd been, been the one of the. Now in the 18, I was one of six key engineers. On the 9995, I was the lead CPU architect. There were about maybe. 10 other people doing that at the time. That shows you how small these teams were. Yeah. But I was the lead CPU architect on a 16-bit CPU, and I was a year and a half out of college. After I left TI, I was brought out by a vice president, a former vice president, Jerry Rogers, who formed Cyrex, who was one of the big clones for the, uh, one of the early clones for the x86 CPU. He had cashed out of that and was founding a company to work on a, and now we're coming around to an to a headset mm -hmm. that would have a we had a an L cost it was an L cost display that's why he went to me to design the L cost chip on a boom a little boom that would come out and we had an L, it was LED LEDs weren't very efficient back then but on a boom that we'd look through looks very much like a, a realware does today what we were going to do and the idea was you could have like a little private monitor up here single eye. Man, it took a lot of heat because LEDs, as I said, weren't very efficient back then. And it used effectively a birdbath, and believe it or not, it used the birdbath optics that we talk about today, only it was not see-through. You had a, 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 a mirror there, and then that went back in. Uh, but that's what we used for that. So that's that was 1998. So I kind of got started into LCOS in 98. So what Carl's talking about is he worked on LCOS. Uh, what LCOS stands for is liquid crystal on silicon. We talked a lot about on OLED on silicon or OLED micro displays or whatever. Very similar uh, topic, except instead of putting OLED, OLED on top of a silicon chip, um, they're putting actually liquid crystal and backlights, basically. Um, so you can see where Carl, he started in chip design and then slowly kind of accidentally crept his way into things that AR is using today because a lot of AR glasses use LCOS. So, so I left, left them, wandered on my own doing some patent um, analyst stuff and then um, uh, formed up Cyndia, which was an LCOS company. I was at Cyndia for seven years while I was a CTO and co-founder. Uh, met up with a nice guy named Mark Howard, who I'm still friends with. Uh, we we decided to go into LCOS, originally working on three chip, uh, three chips for rear projection television. Mm -hmm. By the way, this will tie back uh, later when we get to it with um, uh, you know that uh, Jay Bird, uh, sorry, um, yeah, Jade Bird Display is talking about doing three chips around an X cube for doing a, a LED a micro LED 
projector into a waveguide uh, right. to get color since they can only have one color per chip. Well, yeah. we did the same thing on a, kind of a grander scale. We had three chip LCOS to do rear projection television. Well, my timing was good there too. We thought it had a beautiful picture, by the way. We, we developed it. We got the silicon to work. First silicon worked and all. I designed, I was the lead architect of the IC design of the silicon and kind of architected the controller of it. Uh, other people actually did the design, but I helped architect the controller. And um, um, anyway, we get that to market. And of course, the whole day, heyday of rear projection televisions came to an end about, just about as we got our whole thing developed. Uh, we kind of looked over at DLP and said DLP uh, was the thing. And so we started looking and, and we were almost going to give up on it. But then we looked around and there were these Pico projectors. And this is a good lesson for the whole AR market and why I don't believe people market predictions much. But back then, this is actually just before the iPhone is announced. So it's really timing wise integrates with the iPhone well. The iPhone was just about actually about the same time the iPhone came out because we actually in some of our mock ups said, hey, we could be a big screen for iPhone. Um, so um, the iPhone's coming. OK, so everyone says we're going to put projectors in cell phones. We put cameras in cell phones. Now we should put projectors in cell phones. And Mark and I did our due diligence. We started talking to all these cell phone companies. Every one of them had a had a Pico projector program going. I mean, we talked to back then. The big names were like Nokia, uh, Ericsson, um, uh, the guys in Japan, you know, the Samsungs, every one of them, LG, all of them had cell phone programs going with Pico projectors in them. So we said, this must be a market. Maybe we don't understand it because we, we were doing 500 nit or 500 lumen projectors for rear projection television. Right. And they were talking about 10 nit, uh, 10 lumens. And we were kind of like 10 lumens will barely <laughs> can't do anything with that. But anyway, so everybody, all these customers were doing it. So we said, well, if they're doing it and they're putting all this R&D in it, it must, there must be something there. Yeah. Uh, that might be a lesson for the AR market, not to, not to foreshadow things too much. But one thing I did learn is just because a bunch of R&D groups are doing something does not mean that there's a market for it. Right. Um, as you may know, the Pico projector market never happened. Yeah. But as time as things would happen, just about as you come to the realization the Pico projector market wasn't going to happen, uh, all of a sudden, and about that time, I I decided it was enough of this. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to find something else to do. But just as that happens, towards the end of my thing at stint at, at Sendient, we got uh, a lot of people starting to get interested in, in effectively augmented reality or similar stuff. Uh, and LCOS was a natural for, for this stuff. Uh, you can make really small, the advantage of LCOS is you can make really small pixels. Uh, we were doing fields, by the way, we took our first silicon that was, it was highly, I'm, I'm a CPU jock, so our silicon was highly programmable. And I was able to reprogram our silicon from doing three chip to be able to doing a prototype demonstration of single chip field sequential color. Because the one thing you have to do in the near eye is there is some so-called spatial color, but it doesn't work so well and you don't get pixels. Almost all LCOS today, particularly used in AR, is, um, is field sequential color where you go red, then green, then blue, and you change the mirror. The mirrors are electrodes. They act like mirrors, but by putting a charge on them, you can change how they polarize the light with liquid crystal on top of them. So you, you basically use that to switch. So you, what you do is you usually display a red field, then a green field, then a blue field, and you do that rapidly enough. Now, you will see a lot of the headsets don't really do it that fast, yeah. and you can improve it with head tracking, but if you, know, if you move around, you kind of see rainbow break up. They sometimes call that the rainbow effect. Okay, so let's get into AR.